So I have to confess something I did while in third grade, but my confession will reveal that stupid mistakes can occasionally teach valuable lessons. Do you all remember that game 7-Up growing up? Everyone would put their head down, you couldn't look, and seven people would go around and tap someone. If you got tapped, you would put your thumb up, and at the end of the round, you'd try and guess who tapped you. Well, there was this girl who never got out, so I thought, let me cheat and see if she's cheating. That's my third grade logic right there. The next round started, and I saw who she tapped. I peeked, and when someone guessed her, and she denied tapping them, I yelled out, she cheated, she did pick them. To which the teacher said, how do you know, Sean? <laughs> it was a good question. I didn't think of that part. But I proudly stated that I cheated, which negated her cheating. And well, she got to stay up there. And I was sitting in my chair looking like a false prophet. Because that's what a prophet does. Right? They call out error. They call out lies. They call out injustice. But Jeremiah wasn't calling out other third graders in a game of 7-Up. He was calling out a very specific group of people for their false teachings and bad leadership. If you've been here for uh, the, the past month or so or been watch, watching online, you'll know who this group is. Who do you think it is? It's the priests. And why? Why is God so upset with priests in the Old Testament? particularly at this point in the Bible, in Jeremiah, the years around 600 BCE, and it's taking place in none other than Palestine. Because God was going to use this group of priests to teach others about their creator. God would start with Israel and then work the message throughout the nations. That is the whole gist of the first half of the Bible. So at, at Easter this year, you can say, I bet nobody knows what the first half of the Bible is about. And you could say, it's, about, it's God's plan is to get the priest to teach people about God. And it all, God's plan all relied on these priests doing their part to be good role models and teachers. I once worked in a comic book shop. It was the best job I ever had, no offense, God. Uh, but comic book shops are much cooler, especially when you're 14. But I only got the job because the last guy sold the first appearance of The Punisher, it was a Spider-Man comic, for $3.50. The owner had told him it was $3.50, and so when a customer inquired about the price, he couldn't turn down the steal. He sold a $350 comic for $3.50, because it was $3.50. That ignorant employee lost the store money, and the owner needed some people who knew comics. And so there I was, brought in to make sure mistakes like that were not made anymore. What mistake did that guy make? He had no idea the value of the comic. He likely didn't even like comics and just took the job for the pay. Me, I used to get in trouble for taking my pay in comic books. <laughs> that was, was what, that's what that store needed, someone who loved the product, someone who knew it well and was acquainted with it. That is where Jeremiah found himself. He was the guy God called up to let the Israel's priests know that the gig was up. He grew up loving the law. His dad was one of the few priests. Remember him? Remember his Hilkiah from last week? He was one of the few priests who was even using the Bible anymore. Do you know some churches, they get upset when they use the Bible? I'm not kidding. <laughs> they move away from it. It's a story that's very familiar to these stories. So we learned that last week about Hilkiah and what happened in the temple. So God's going to put it on Jeremiah's heart to go and call out all the lies and falsehoods being promoted by none other than the temple priests. Because I believe Jeremiah's story is Jesus' story. If you want to know about Jesus, just read, about, just read Jeremiah's story. Look at these similarities. During his ministry, what did Jesus do? Did he call out sinners? Did he go to Times Square with his sign and say, you're all going to hell? Is there any passage? How many Christians do that? Based off of what? Who told them to go do that? It's not in the Bible. Leaders, bad teachers told them to go do that. Did Jesus come to call out the politicians? Was he on MSN and Fox News as a commentator? 
saying you shouldn't do this or do that? No. Did he call out the economists for the economy? No. If you read the Gospels, Jesus attacks one group and one group alone. It's the priests. The priests. People like me. Jesus would be mad at people like me. Not me, though, right? <laughs> Maybe everybody else. So what did the priests do that they needed some admonishment from Jesus? Well, we can find out by seeing what Jeremiah said. You know, we all know the Gospels. You know, when you hear a song, you don't think about the words. You just go through it. So sometimes hearing the story in a different way makes it pop. And that's what Jeremiah is going to do. In Jeremiah chapter 2, we're going to hear this. It says, the word of the Lord came to me. So you open up Jeremiah and you say, it says, the word of the Lord came to me. Right? You, you, want, to, you want to get the wisdom and knowledge of God. So we stop there. What do you think that looks like? The word of the Lord came to me. That he's in aisle 6 at Shop and Stop and the word of the Lord came to him and he just falls on the ground? Is that how it happened? What do you think he was doing? He was meditating and praying. He was reading the Torah. Why is this important? Because God speaks to us through those exercises. You might say, Sean, why do I have to meditate and read and pray? To which I'll say, why do you need a phone to call somebody? Or why do you need a car? to get from here and there. Why do I have to log on to the Wi-Fi to get, in, to get in? It's because those are the tools that are required to access those things. How loud is our, our world? Is it not very loud? It's so loud and it's so overstimulating that God creates meditation as a system to, for us to access the quiet realm that where God can be heard, his presence felt. And so that's where Jeremiah heard the word of God. Where were the priests? We know that they weren't reading the Torah, so what were they doing? Last week we find out what King Josiah and Hilkiah discovered. The law was lost, hidden in the temple. Priests who didn't have the law do you think that they were hearing from God every week when they preached their sermons? Do you think that they were meditating? Do you think they were loving people as they love themselves? No. They were acting like any priest in any other nation. God's plan is halted at this point in the Bible. So God calls Jeremiah to go to the priest and tell them what he has to say. Jeremiah chapter 2 says that Jeremiah, in his quiet time with God, heard a message to go to Jerusalem, and by that he means go to the priests in Jerusalem and tell them what I have to say. When Jesus went to Jerusalem as a boy, who was he debating with? The priests. The priests and the scribes. When he was preaching, who did he often come into contact that gave him a hard time? the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Jesus actually says things like this, I've come not to condemn the world. Did you hear that? Jesus says, I've come not to condemn the world. What's been the message for 2,000 years? That Jesus came to condemn us. That's a lie. Jesus said, I've come not to do that. But listen, what it, he says, I've come to save it. I came to save people from, from the world. Save it from who? Right? We think that the devil, that's the devil, but God has his people in the world, right? God uses people. Guess who else has his people in the world? And you won't believe what they're exceptionally adept at. Infiltrating religious institutions. Why? Because the devil doesn't want God's plan to happen. Listen to what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew about priests. Don't ever give this to me as a card. Uh, please. <laughs> it says this. In Matthew chapter 23, it says, You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting worms, rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. 
You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds, you build granite tombs for the prophets. So he's saying you build granite tombs for the prophets and marble monuments for your saints. And you say that if you lived in the days of your ancestors, right? Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's saying you, you built uh, graves to these prophets and said that if you had lived during your, that, their time, the blood wouldn't be on your hands. And Jesus says you protest too much. You're cut from the same cloth as those murderers. You're snakes, cold-blooded snakes. Who's the one who uh, pulled humans away from God's plan in the garden? What creature was it? A snake. Jesus calls them brood of vipers. He calls them snakes, the ones that lead people away. It often happens in churches because people are coming to look. He says, it's on account of people like you, the priests, that I have to send prophets and wise guides to counter you generation after generation. Jesus is saying this. And generation after generation, you treat them like dirt. You greet them with lynch mobs and you hound them with abuse. He says, you can't squirm out of this. You've been doing it for so long. And Jesus is looking over Jerusalem and he says this. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He's looking at Jerusalem. And this is, this is a commentary. He says, murder of the prophets. What's Jeremiah? What's Jesus? What's Isaiah? What's Ezekiel? It's his own people that reject him. Killer of the ones who brought you God's news. How often I've ached to embrace your children the way a hen gathers her chick under her wings and you wouldn't let me. You're now desolate. That's what God, that's what Jesus says when he looks at Jerusalem. So Jesus says something that speaks to Jeremiah again saying, it's on account of people like you, priests, that I have to send prophets and wise guides and scholars generation after generation. Look at a modern day one, Martin Luther King, right? He's a prophet. He comes to bring, he comes to call out error. And then what did the people do? They get rid of him. And then what happens? They build a monument to him. That's how this, this story is a repetition. It's happening over and over. And Jesus is speaking to the priests of his day saying, you always do this. You've done it before, just like you did in the days of Jeremiah. Jesus was reminding them of that very prophet. This week was Groundhog Day. You ever see Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? It's like the Bible's telling Israel's history in a way that's like a movie. That every few hundred years or so, the same thing that happened in the previous few hundred years happens again. History repeats itself. God sends a vision to some person. That person establishes priests to help them, and those priests become corrupt, and there's a need for an intervention. And it's the prophets, true priests, who are called to get that going. What did Jeremiah say 500 years prior to Jesus? He begins by speaking to the priests of his day. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, you, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. So if you open up Jeremiah, that's what you'd start reading in Jeremiah chapter 2. What's he talking about? He's speaking to when the Israelites left Egypt. When God delivered them through the Red Sea, God is looking back and saying to the priests through Jeremiah, Remember how we got to where we currently are, Israel? You've abandoned your God, but do you remember where you started? Where did they start? In the wilderness, when they left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, and God likens them to a bride. Do you remember that series we did last year where we looked at how Jesus used the parable of a groom and a bride as metaphors for his church? It wasn't a new metaphor. It was an old one the same one that Jeremiah used, saying that God found this people, he fell in love with them, and he protected them. They had no land, they were captives, but he made a way for them. That's how he begins his sermon to the priest. But it's the second part, I think, that may have gotten him in trouble. Jeremiah is going to tell them what God thinks about their situation. 
that it's that they had abandoned the covenant with God to follow his ways. So he says, beginning in verse 4 and ending in verse 8, and you can follow along in your bulletin if you like. He says, so what was the charge against the priests? First, it was a reminder that they had forgotten something. God rescued and established the Israelites as his people, covenanting with them that if they would be his people, he would be their God. That was the deal. They made a deal. And they accepted that deal, found success. And once they had success, what do you think they did? Did they stay faithful to their God or did they begin to start looking at other nations saying, oh, let's be like them. We need a big army. We need a king. We need a temple. We need to consolidate power. And mostly we need priests who will follow our agenda and not push us into God's. That's what happened 2,500 years ago, and it's never happened since. No, it happens all the time. It's like Groundhog Day. We keep repeating history. We keep repeating history. You know why? Why do we repeat history? Do you know Jeremiah is not in the there's like one passage that's in the lectionary. So if I use the lectionary, you guys would never hear about this book. Why, do th why does history repeat itself? Who knows the story of Jeremiah? Do you think that you can go to most churches and say, you guys know what Jeremiah is, right? No. It's like the law has been hidden in the temple, tucked away, nobody reading it. Who knows the major theme of Jeremiah? Who knows what happens in the story? And who knows what happens when we can't answer questions about our past, about our history? The same thing happens over and over and over and over again. History repeats itself when we don't know our history. So Jeremiah calls out Israel's priests for forgetting their first love. They forgot the reason they even set out to be a nation themselves. Read our history books. Do you know what John Winthrop said about America? He said, we're going to come here. He was the, one of the, 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 the main guys who, who brought people here. He says, we're going to come over here. And we weren't perfect. But this was, this was the impetus for them. You know, you don't, I'm not going to leave my, my land and potentially die to make some more money. <laughs> I would only do that if I believed God was calling me to do that. And that's what the early settlers believed, that God had called them over here. That's why in Connecticut there's places called, what, New Canaan, <laughs> Bethlehem, Bethel. It's not an accident. They were trying to continue the story of the Bible because it's Groundhog Day, to trying to tell us something. And he said, he said, he wrote in his journal, we're about to do something in this country, in, in this land, and may God be with us. He made a deal, a covenant, like the Israelites. May God be with us. And if God is with us, we're going to prosper. But he, he wrote this. He said, but if we do not follow and keep our deal with God, we are to be mocked among all the nations. He was, he was pulling that story right out of the Bible and living by it. So I look at our country and I see, I see a tear. I see that this country, which was founded on good things, yes, there were bad things and we need to work on that stuff, but there, it was mainly a good cause. And if we lose connection with why we came here, then we'll lose connection of, of why we need to continue staying here. And that's what you're seeing happen in our country. It's a loss of meaning and purpose. And that meaning and purpose can be found right here. So. Jeremiah tells them that they've stopped inquiring about the Lord, all the people. Even the priests and the scribes are telling you you don't need to inquire of the Lord. Which means nobody's following God's plans, his ways, which meant ultimately that God and humans would remain stuck until someone listened to what the prophet had to say. And what was he saying? That the Hebrew people had forgotten their God because the priests had forgotten their God. And what happens when you forget God? Do you know the Dylan song, Bob Dylan, where he says, everybody's worshiping something. <laughs> what happens when you don't worship this God? You replace it with another God. That's why God was always saying, don't replace me, because it's a natural instinct. It'll be God or money or whatever. 
So who did they replace God with? Have you ever heard of the God named Baal? We've probably read, if you've ever read the Bible, you've come across this character. Has anybody ever explained it to you? See, these priests, man. <laughs> What's the first commandment? Thou shalt not have any other gods, for the Lord your God is jealous. Has anybody gotten a lesson that there might be other gods that God would get so upset and jealous about it? Why would God be jealous of another god? What had happened in Israel was that the priests started worshiping another deity named Baal. And if you read the Bible, you'll, you'll see his name. What we'll soon find ourselves asking is, how did the priests of Yahweh move from worshiping uh, Yahweh to worshiping Baal? How could that happen? How could that happen? If history repeats itself, and we don't know these stories, that's how it happens. So, what happened next? Is everybody itching to know? Guess what you're going to have to do? Come back next week. Netflix does it. Disney Plus does it. We're doing it here at church now. Come back next week to find out what happens next in the story of Jeremiah.